number of you have asked um, whether copies of, of tonight's speech uh, were available. Uh, well, a good deal of it is in this book, Conservatism, Re Conservatism Revisited and the New Conservatism, What Went Wrong, and in the other book, uh, The Unadjusted Man. Take the two together and you have uh, a good deal of that material. But then we've had the same question about um, all of the other lectures too. So we thought that what we'd do, and so many ideas have been thrown at us in the last uh, four weeks, and so many definitions of liberalism and conservatism have been presented that they may well be running together in your minds. Uh, we thought we'd, um, we have the tapes and we'll get together sort of extended summaries with uh, uh, considerable selections from the speeches. We can't get the whole thing out, that would be a massive job. But we'll, we'll send out to you uh, what seems to be at least the gist of each of the four speeches, and everybody who's registered in the series will receive a copy of it. But don't, it won't be there tomorrow. <laughs> it'll, it'll take a little time, but it'll get there. Um, well, we have a number of questions here, of course, and uh, some of them inevitably relate to, uh, well, who in the current American political scene would you call a true conservative by your definition of conservatism? If anybody. I, I would uh, say, first of all, that uh, my whole point was that uh, nobody is all of one piece. I mean, except in the textbooks of professors, uh, nobody is the conservative or the liberal or the radical. Uh, things are an amalgam, as I mentioned how the New Deal was an amalgam of what I thought were conserving aspects, which I admire, and uh, radical anti-Supreme Court aspects, which I detest. And I think this is true of, of, of human beings, too. Uh, uh, they are all an amalgam, and one point a man will be this way, and another, uh, another something else. So far as particular programs go, I don't think people ought to uh, be conservative or liberal or anything else. I, I think in, in uh, such rapid change that uh, the important thing is to have a substantive approach, have, have a sense of uh, the immediate problem in, in a changing world and, and solving it, not worrying whether thereby you are acting in a conservative way or a liberal way or, or a radical way. And in that sense, by the way, I think Kennedy was very good. I'm, I'm not sure that, that he would be a conservative. Uh, or, or uh, that we, uh, as a whole, or, or any other ism. Certainly, in many ways, he's, he's a liberal, and even in some ways, a very doctrinaire kind of. And he seemed to go around, uh, go for more technology, and, and, and this kind of, to me, is very superficial kind of progress. Uh, a lot of things I didn't care for about him, but I think he did have the sense of, of seeing the immediate problem, the immediate need for it, as in the Cuba crisis, and not worrying too much about which ideology does this, uh, does this uh, put, put you into. And, um, uh, he's an amalgam like everybody else. I, I, I would say uh, there, there were aristocratic elements and there were, uh, there, there were plebeian elements and so on. I, sometimes I used to think, um, I, I voted for him, by, by the way, uh, but uh, did have and do have m many misgivings. There was a kind of ruthlessness sometimes that, that, that was very frightening, but, but at least uh, in view of his opponent and so on, he was an educated man and, and knew, knew something about the issues. And, uh, but um, I, I sometimes used to think that uh, the whole key to Kennedy was uh, when you listened to him and ignored everything he said, programs, ideas and everything, but just listened to the letter A, nothing else. <laughs> and half the time it would be a Harvard R, B B Bath, and another time it would be sort of South Boston air, eh, you see. And it seemed to be sort of a key, key to him in many ways. And there he was surrounded, see, by his uh, Harvard aristocratic <laughs> traditionalist uh, professors and his one, wonderful, lovable, down-to-earth Irish politicians. And uh, so there was a kind of ambiguity there. And uh, he never lived long enough to resolve it. But I'd like to, uh, uh, but I, I think, um, I'm more for him and against him, and I'd like to quote something of, uh, I'm not a specialist in politics, I mean, I'm a poet working in the cultural sphere and so on, but as somebody who does know a lot about politics, Mr. Walter Lippmann, I'd, I'd like to quote what he says. And uh, uh, he says, um, this was while Mr. Kennedy was still alive, so it's not just post-mortem piety, and I agree with this. He says, though Mr. Kennedy is a progressive and a liberal, he is also a profound conservative, and only the befuddled theorists find that strange and hard to understand. I would say bravo to that. The theorists, either liberal or conservative, would find that hard to understand. But I would go along with Lippmann that there was 
uh, much that was conservative uh, in the best sense in Kennedy. Uh, among other things, you, you best conserve, you best keep workers from being revolutionary by giving them a stake in the status quo. Uh, you best keep a minority, such as the Negro uh, minority, from being radical by giving them a stake in the status quo. You conservatize your minorities by giving them a stake in things. And this is, in the best sense, conservatism in the policy towards Negroes and towards the working class, to give them enough of a stake in the status quo that their motive will be uh, more to conserve than, than to revolt. Uh, St St Stevenson is an example of Oh, very much. I mean, we don't have an institutionalized aristocracy. We don't have the House of Lords, but we do have certain certain families that that, that come close to that. I mean, the Adamses, for example, three generations of Adamses and, and Roosevelts, and and I think Stevenson represents very much the the aristocrat in politics. Uh, you remember that famous photograph when you saw a hole in his shoe? Now, could you imagine Nixon having a hole in his shoe? Nixon would have his trousers pressed and the latest shoes because he would not be secure in his status and being insecure in status. He would have to act more right-wing than he really wants to, because that's what really right-wing radicalism is. It's people who are socially insecure and who want to prove that they're, you know, that they're quality folks with their lace curtain, you see. And, and therefore, they have to take a more right-wing position than they really would, and just as they have to wear pressed trousers, not baggy old pants. But as Stevenson being sure, you see, if his position could, could have uh, holes in his shoes. And, and, and uh, I'd like to read something that, that Stevenson said about the uh, word conservatism and then, then drop, the, drop the question, because I find him sam sympathetic in... In in, uh, in in many in many ways, um, uh, his guts and saying to the American Legion, I remember in this campaign of '52 that he was uh, denouncing McCarthyism, and then he went to labor unions and warned them against the tyranny of big labor. This 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 this, this, this is the courage of a, of a country squire. I mean, only a Churchill or Stevens and someone with a certain social security, status security, will have the, the courage to, you know, to tell labor unions that there shouldn't be a tyranny of labor and American Legion that they shouldn't wave the flag so much. Uh, but but, uh, uh, but he, here's, what, uh, here's what Stevenson said. This is the 1952 campaign. The 1956 campaign, he unfortunately had the idea he might win. And therefore, instead of making, making great speeches, he made Madison Avenue speeches. But in 1952, when he didn't think he could win, he made great speeches. And, uh, I mean, he said we really thought. And, and let, let me read you this, and then we drop this question. Uh, the, the answer is that nobody is wholly that, but at least these people to me are, are partly sympathetic. Uh, as Charles Evans, Hughes, Charles Evans Hughes was among the Republicans, I, I want to keep him even balanced. I mean, as much for Republicans as Democrats, Charles Evans Hughes was to me the type of aristocratic, noblesse oblige, uh, conservative in the Republican Party. Now, here, here's what Stevenson says in 1952. The strange alchemy of time has, has somehow uh, converted uh, the Democrats into the truly conservative party of this country, the party dedicated to conserving all that is best and building solidly and safely on these foundations. The Republicans, by contrast, are behaving like the radical party, the party of the reckless and the embittered, bent on dismantling institutions which have been built solidly into our social fabric. I would like to in, uh, interject, he's writing at the time of McCarthyism, although I wouldn't agree with this entirely. I think the Republicans are much better than the Democrats in certain things. They're more for local rights, local customs, uh, against, uh, against bigness. But um, I think Stevenson was right at the time when he says the Republicans are behaving like a radical party because uh, they were being, in those days, McCarthyites. And and then he goes on to say, our, our social security system and our Democratic Party's sponsorship of the social reforms and advances of the past two decades are conservatism at its best. Certainly there can be nothing more conservative, he says, than, than to change when change is due, to reduce tensions and wants by wise changes rather than to stand pat stubbornly until, like King Canute, we are engulfed by relentless forces that will always go too far. Uh, I think this gets some of the sense of, of conservatism. A Birkin conservative would say you only provoke revolution by having no, no, uh, uh, no uh, uh, New Dealish reforms. You provoke revolution. If we had not had a New Deal, if Herbert Hoover had been reelected, we would today have a communist party, perhaps as big as that in France. In that sense, social reforms uh, prevent rev revolutions. But you must play it by ear and have a sense of timing. Too much social reform would be too liberal or too radical, whatever you want. But it has to be a timing enough to prevent the workers from going to the left, you see, to give them, uh, give them a stake in the status quo. And I, I think Stevenson in this, in this quotation uh, has it very much. I would have thought the Republicans now have three men who would uh, meet the bill, as you've uh, described it. Rockefeller, Lodge, and Scranton, all men uh, quite secure in their social status, uh, men of uh, the, arist the aristocracy in your sense, men with a sense of noblesse oblige, wouldn't they? Uh I would agree completely, yes. I, I, I thought it was more the people who actually had held office. But I, I would say all, all, all three of those, even perhaps Scranton the most, 
uh, be, because uh, he's more understated, he's more, he's more reserved, and uh, uh, it, it, it isn't as new with him, it isn't so much new money as, as, as with the Rockefeller money, it isn't, uh, it isn't that much personality being turned on. I, I'm a little uh, uh, leery you know, of warm, glowing personality, which, which isn't really warm and glowing, but I'd say all, all three, yes. In, 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 yeah, all, 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 all three, I'd say, in, in a sense. I, I would agree with that. In fact, I, I don't know how I would vote. I mean, I'm really not that political. I, I really mean that. And Charles Evan Hughes, among those Republicans who were in power, I was always a great, great market. What's your approach to the problem of poverty in this country? Uh, do you mean this in a broader sense, institutions like trade unionism and so on? Or, uh, well, uh, you can deal with it any way you want to. <laughs> I, I just read the questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I have to do a little telepathy towards the person who wrote the question. Maybe by reading the hand, doing handwriting analysis, I can see what they want, because that's such a tremendous uh, problem. Um, I've, I've already, um, I've already um, in indicated that I was with the seventh Earl of Shaftesbury, who, who, who believed out of noblesse oblige, out of uh, it may be the wrong snobbish reason, but whatever the reason, out of the sense of the, of the Lord to his people, that, you know, uh, you just can't let things go on in factories uh, the, the, the way they are. And uh, he and then Israeli in the 1870s introduced uh, legislation for, for the poor. And I, I think, I, I think uh, the conservative has to be, the, uh, the man for the organic society has to, uh, has to work against poverty. I, uh, I mean, I'm not just thinking of the Lyndon Johnson program, that's a slogan. I mean, I'm trying to be serious. These are political slogans that people say to be reelected and so on. So I, I don't want to comment on slogans on, on either side, and poverty is obviously an electioneering slogan. But to take it in a more, more serious sense, regardless of who says it and whether the motive is a slogan, of course a conservative, I think, uh, has to be against laissez-faire and has to, uh, has to uh, work against poverty. O otherwise, the whole thing is just a hoax and it's all uh, gone. I mean, in an atomistic society, Say a John Stuart Mill society, atomistic uh, and, and everything, all values relative, you don't have to work against poverty because uh, the government is not uh, noblesse oblige, not noblesse obligated, you see. Uh, it's just interest groups fighting uh, against each other and therefore there's no obligation against poverty. But you cannot justify as an organic society, which is not really an open society, it's a society limited by certain shared values. You, you can't justify an organic society which has uh, certain institutions like uh, monarchy in, in England or Supreme Court and Constitution here. You can't justify a society with institutions which which is not open, because once you've institutions, you've limited the openness, you can't justify it unless it takes care of the poor, you say. Uh, you can only ignore the poor if you have the Adam Smith at atomistic society. So since we, uh, therefore I think a conservative has a duty uh, to end poverty. Uh, just as the, the feudal lord couldn't let his, uh, feudal lord couldn't let his peasants starve, the capitalists can fire them and just throw them in the open market, and, and even rightly so from his viewpoint. But uh, the, the feudal lord, just because he has more power over his peasants than a capitalist, had also had, a, had to feed them in bad times. I mean, this is what noblesse oblige is, this is what an organic society is, this is the, the duty duties which go with privileges, the privileges which conservatives give to certain institutions or groups are not justified unless there is also a duty. And this is why I favor all the social, the social reforms of the, of the New Deal or in England of, of Shaftesbury and, and Israeli, and, and uh, indeed, uh, as I say, without it, it would just be having the privileges, you see, and, and not, the, not the duties. And uh, once, you, uh, once you have... Um, uh, once you, you're going to fight against poverty, you have to institutionalize it. I mean, a conservative doesn't believe in just writing laws on a book. That, that means nothing. I mean, the French have had so many constitutions. The Soviets have an excellent constitution which guarantees free speech, free elections, uh, free public assembly. What does it mean, you see? This is why I'm dubious about any, any, any grand slogans. So it's not enough to say we're against poverty or we abolish it. There has to be an institution that works against it. This is what the conservative would say, something concrete that you can touch, something tangible. And, and this is this is, this is uh, where I would come to my attitude to trade unionism uh, and, uh, and why I'm for it. And, and uh, I don't want to seem to give the impression that I'm just being paradoxical and being everything you think a conservative is not. Uh, it, isn't, it isn't as simple or as crude as that. Really, in a, in a thought through, thought out way, uh, I, I, I very much favor the trade unions. And, um, uh, I'd like to read you, uh, 
reads or something on them uh, from somebody other than myself again because I want to get away from the thing that I'm giving you something subjective and very personal here. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an oddball and just giving you something very personal. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to read uh, something about, from a very important scholar of the trade union movement who knows a lot more than I, uh, Frank Tenen, uh, Tannenbaum, A Philosophy of Labor, 1952. Have any of you read that book? Frank Tannenbaum, do you, do you know, know the book? And, um, uh, to justify why I think, uh, <laughs> so the professor gets quizzed. Thing, you see, prof let's put professors on the other side of the barricades. Put them to a quiz. You see, you have a professor here, the social sciences. Um, I'm not. I don't teach. I don't teach the social sciences. Um, I, I believe that the free trade unions unconsciously are among our ablest representatives of the word they hate and misunderstand, conservatism. This is one of the ironies that the best conservatives are often unconsciously so and, and indeed uh, hate it. I, I think that they restore uh, to the atomized proletariat an organic uh, unity, the proletariat which has been atomized by the cash nexus uh, idea of, of uh, sort of economic individualism, which is, I say, the one kind of individualism which, which doesn't interest me as, uh, at all. I'm, I'm for artistic individualism, but, but economically, I believe in a non-individual organic society uh, with a responsibility for poverty. Organic, not in a, a statist, uh, you know, the communistic status coercive sense, but in, in, in a voluntary sense. And I, I think the trade unions give back to the atomized proletariat that organic unit they've lost. And they do this not, not just, uh, you know, by raising wages, but they do more than that they you know they get together they hold wakes when the member dies they're, they're a social club they, I mean in other words, they, they give some of this human warmth which you lose in the atomistic society uh, and uh, therefore the trade union is really the wonderful uh, alternative to both doctrinaire capitalism and doctrinaire socialism, both of which are too materialistic uh, for my mind. Now here's a passage from Frank Tan Tannenbaum and I think by quoting this uh, you'll see it isn't just some, some, some whim of my own. Uh, and uh, the fact that trade unions hate the way conservatism doesn't bother me, as I say, because uh, I'm, I mean, this is in the reality, not, not the, the, the terminology. He writes, trade unionism is the conservative movement of our time. It is the counter-revolution. Unwittingly, it has turned its back upon most of the political and economic ideas that have nourished Western Europe and the United States during the last two centuries. In practice, though not in words, Trade unionism denies the heritage that stems from the French Revolution and from English liberalism. That was the heritage of bourgeois, bourgeois individualism, you see. It is also a complete repudiation of Marxism, because trade unions are not done by the state, you see, which is Marxism, but, but, but uh, in what I would call a Tory socialist way, in other words, voluntarily. It's not the state, which is my objection to Marxist socialism. So it's, it reputed then both the French Revolution and English liberalism and Marxism. And then he goes on to say, in contrast with communism, fascism, and laissez-faire capitalism, the trade union has involved the clustering of men about their work. This fusion, the new medieval style, organic society, has been going on for a long time and has been largely unplanned and unconscious. There is a great tradition of humanism and compassion in European and American politics, philosophy, and law, which counters, at first ineffectively, the driving forces operating for the atomization of society and the isolation of man. That tradition in England includes such names as Cobbett, Shaftesbury, Romilly, Dickens, Byron, Coleridge, Carlyle, the conservatives, uh, Rusk, and Charles Kingsley. The trade union, he says, is the real alternative to the authoritarian state. The trade union is our modern society, the only true society that industrialism has fostered. As a true society, it is concerned with the whole man and embodies the possibilities of both the freedom and the security essential uh, to human dignity. Trade unions is the conservative movement of our time. Well, I, I quoted that. I, I don't endorse this completely. I mean, Hoffa, no. Trade unionism, yes. But uh, I mean, I don't endorse this completely. Moreover, uh, trade unionism is becoming too much like the capitalist that fights. You know, it becomes itself a little bit cash nexus and inhuman, over organized, big, mechanical, you know, much too big and, and, and impersonal. I mean, it's becoming. The, 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 the trade unions are becoming the capitalism of the working class. In other words, everything I object to in capitalism, I object to they're becoming mechanized and so on. But with these reservations still as a trend, I, 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 I would go along with, with what uh, Tannenbaum says in this quotation, and I certainly would go along uh, with a war against poverty. Indeed, without that, you, you're going to get communism. I mean, the, 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 that's clear enough. You don't get conservatism, you get communism unless you do something uh, about, about poverty, which should not be why you're doing it. I mean, 
mean, I hate this idea that you do things for, you know, for, for, you should do it, but, uh, you know, for its own sake. I mean, you have an ethical obligation in an organic society, organic in a unified society, take care of everyone, even the poor. In an atomistic society, you don't have that obligation. Everybody's an individual. He sinks or swims on his own. Uh, society is completely open, and you have no obligation at all to your neighbor. That's less a fair, free enterprise, the early John Stuart Mill. But a uh, conservative and organic society, you can't have it both ways. If you have the privileges, the elite, the institutions, the aristocracy of conservatism, you have to take care of the poor. I hope this, this answers it. Thank you. Well, we have a great many more questions, but we've run out of time. Uh, and this, in fact, will close our series, during which we've had four different views of conservatism and liberalism, all very complicated positions. In fact, some of you, a few of you, have said, well, we hope that you'd clear the matter up for us once and for all, you know. <laughs> And uh, we haven't. In fact, it really isn't a university's function to make uh, things less complicated than they are. Ultimately, uh, in fact, we're going to have to sort these things out for ourselves. Uh, we do plan, as I indicated, to send you out these um, uh, summaries, extended um, uh, selections uh, from these lectures so that you can think them over and see what it was precisely they contributed to your understanding of these problems. But as you read them over, I think you'll be reminded of the fact that um, this has turned out to be a very interesting, a very provocative series indeed. And for the major contribution uh, to our series made tonight by Peter Virick, we are duly appreciative. <laughs>